Good morning. You're going to hear me. Some of you that have been, um, been, been with us since Wednesday are going to get sick of hearing me welcome people, but this conference, we have people that um, come sometimes. They're only able to be with us for one day, so I'd like to extend another welcome on behalf of Carla, uh, the entire Carla staff, and on behalf of the planning committee to the fourth international conference on language immersion education. This morning's uh, introducer, Amy Young, is the conference assistance, has been at my side for uh, the entire year, helping to put together all of the various details. And I just really want to extend a big thank you to Amy. Amy is a PhD student in Second Languages and Cultures Education within Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Minnesota. Here's Amy. A good program hinges on a really good teacher, Esther DeJong reminds us. Throughout her career, Esther has worked to help teachers improve instruction and administrators create quality immersion programs through reflective practice. Having worked as a teacher and administrator, as well as teacher educator, her work is firmly grounded in the classroom and resonates with practitioners and researchers in bilingual and bicultural education. Her engagement in schools is evidenced by her recent book, Foundations for Multilingualism in Education from Principles to Practice, in which she outlines overarching principles of educational equity that engage schools and practices that reflect respect, non-discrimination, and fairness for all students. She has also written about strategies for equalizing linguistic benefits in diverse classrooms, language policy, and teacher discourse and beliefs. Her wealth of publications can be found in peer-reviewed journals such as the Bilingual Research Journal, the International Journal of Bilingualism and Bilingual Education, Language Policy, and Language and Education. Born in the Netherlands with degrees from Boston and Tilburg Universities, Esther now works at the University of Florida in Gainesville as an Associate Professor of ESOL Bilingual Education in the School of Teaching and Learning. She's recently received the University of Florida's College of Education prestigious B.A. Smith Research Professorship, a three-year post, during which time she will investigate ways that elementary teachers can best help young language learners bridge the languages in order to succeed in school. We are very honored to have her with us today to present Linguistic and Cultural Pluralism as a Guide for Daily Decision Making. Please join me in welcoming Esther Dijon. Did you turn that mic off? I think that's probably the best introduction I've ever heard. It's fabulous. Thank you, Amy. Um, thank you all for coming on the Saturday morning, and thank you for the organization of this conference for a, an incredible com conference, very well organized, but with excellent, excellent presentations, too. Um, the title of my presentation is very cumbersome, so what um, the shorthand version of the presentation really is contextualizing two-way immersion education. Um, you'll notice I'll walk. I've been telling the people that I'm not a keynote who stands behind the lecture that makes me more nervous than anything else. So I'll be walking a little bit. If it's more too much of a ping pong thing, let me know. Um, I'm going to be talking about two-way immersion programs because that's my background, um, but I think some of the principles I'll be talking about are applicable across the many different contexts that we're talking about. So some exploratory questions for today. What I want to be thinking about is what does it mean to contextualize two-way immersion programs and why is it important? And while we're thinking about contextualizing and putting two-way immersion in local practice, while we do that, how do we ensure that we maintain program integrity? Because I think that's some of the tension that I've been hearing um, as we're trying to figure out how do we match the program with the local conditions that we have and then figuring out what then there's the model that we have to follow and there's tensions there. And I'll end up with um, what we may call the four Ps principled and purposeful policies and practices. 
that's what we need to move towards. So the overview of today's talk, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on two-way immersion programs. I won't spend too much time on it, um, but it's kind of important to remember that two-way immersion has a context that's quite unique and different from, say, foreign language immersion context. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about why do we need to move beyond just focusing on models and questions of design. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of that. And then at the end, I will present um, the four principles, the principles that um, Amy referenced, that I have found useful to think about policies and practices at the local level. And, and I'll introduce those at the very end there. OK, so this is familiar to you. We all know that we're part of a dual language umbrella. And that what we have in common is that we have goals of biliteracy and bilingualism, that we aim for a great level um, academic achievement and that we strive for multicultural competence for all students. Two-way immersion programs are a very special program within that umbrella and they distinguish themselves by enrolling a dual language population. So in an ideal world, we have half of the students who are fluent speakers of both languages in the program. So if that's English and Spanish, you would have fluent speakers of English, fluent speakers of Spanish. Um, or in a Korean program, Korean speakers and um, English speakers. This is a very important dynamic. It changes a lot of different things by bringing to these very different groups together. And the reasons why, I think you all know, is that the benefits from interacting with the native speaker gives you that more opportunities to be talking and using the target language, not just the teacher. This is Coral Way Elementary, the school that started, I think is credited at least with starting two-way immersion programs in 1963. The school is still there. Um, I visited um, probably about nine years ago and was very impressed by the fact that in fact they have four, at the time they had four, one, two, three, three different programs within the school, all dual language. One was a gifted and talented program. One was kind of a regular dual language program. And one was targeted specifically for newcomers. So their English language learner population, but everybody had dual language. They just had different strengths within the school. And I want to just point out that two-way immersion has this bilingual education history which is very different than foreign language education history. And as you well know, bilingual education in this country, the United States, has been very controversial. And so that means that in two-way immersion programs, that controversy kind of comes with the two-way immersion program, that social political context comes with two-way immersion programs. I think Donna yesterday in her um, plenary said, you know, in, we have beliefs about language, but when it comes to heritage language learners, children of immigrants, immigrant learners, second generation. We have uh, the language and beliefs about immigration and beliefs about linguistic and cultural diversity and what we believe this country to be about comes into the two-way program. And it might be a little bit different when you're talking about a one-way foreign language immersion program. Um, one thing that concerned people in the 1960s and 70s as we were trying to establish bilingual education for language minority speakers was that they ended up being very much segregated. And I purposefully put LEP in there. It's an old term. Um, and do you still remember what that stands for? Limited English proficient. Uh, we don't like that term anymore because it's so deficit oriented, but it kind of tells you where we were at. Um, most of the programs that we designed, even if they were bilingual programs, tended to be transitional programs that still took a deficit perspective. You're limited in English, we gotta fix you, and then we put you in a mainstream classroom, right? Um, and so there were people who were very concerned with that because when they, when, when they went into schools, where do you think the bilingual program was housed? In the basement, right? or in the closet. I mean, there's many stories of bilingual programs that were treated that way. And of course, students and teachers were marginalized within those settings. It was hard to do quality education under those circumstances. And so people were very concerned about um, the segregation of those students. And at the same time, of course, we have desegregation processes going on with other groups in the United States, and so we emphasize desegregation. We're thinking about what can we offer language majority language speakers um, 
to make it attractive for them to integrate with other students. And two-way immersion programs, at least one of the ones that I've been working with at Barbary School, one of the motivators to establish the school was to keep the quote-unquote white parents in the school that was very much part of the design of the program that was very, very important. And so people were very aware of both the social benefits of integration and integrating students, as well as the linguistic benefits, because we realized those models. So when it comes to two-way, we kind of talk about two general models, the 9010 model and the 1550 model, and you can kind of see how the language use distributes. Um, the important thing is that, like with all dual language programs, the minimum amount of instruction is 50% in the minority language. That piece is going to be very important. The 9010 model kind of ups the ante, right, in the, in the minority language and say we're going to actually overcompensate for the lower status of that language, whereas the 5050 model kind of puts them on a playing field. And so one of the things that we've done, looking at program design features, we've asked questions such as, what does the model look like? Which languages do we have? How much time do we have in each language once we've decided 9010 versus 5050? How do we organize that? Do we have two teachers? Do we have one teacher? What subject do we have in which language? Those are really important design questions that kind of come with the model. And we've spent a lot of time over the last um, 20 years or so to figure out, do these models have positive outcomes? This is important because, remember, we come out of a bilingual education history that questions the role of bilingual education. So justifying that this works is a very important agenda, and we've spent a lot of time worrying about that, and we have to. So we've come, looked at two-way programs and outcomes, and we've compared two-way programs with other models. And the message from that research is very consistent. Right, so two-way programs, um, and Catherine Lindholm Leary has done tremendous work in that, Thomas and Collier have done work on that, and others as well, that regardless, almost, regardless of the kinds of context that you're in, um, the, the results show that there are positive outcomes for students in the two-way immersion program. So this is true in 9010, it's true in 5050, it's true when you have more middle-class students, it's true when you have more lower SES students. So it's a positive picture. And so the possibilities of two-way immersion are actually pretty amazing when you think about where we are at in this country and where the two-way immersion program wants to move. And I'm just putting this up as kind of a rough distribution between what I would call assimilationist ways of thinking about society and more pluralist ways of thinking about society. And I'm putting this up because two-way immersion programs have to make such an incredible effort to create what Rebecca Freeman calls the alternative discourses to the dominant discourse that we have in US society. And um, you can kind of read that for yourself, and I think you're familiar with this debate, that one of the visions is that monolingualism really should be the outcome, that diversity is kind of problematic. It's not that it's not there. We would like to streamline diversity. You can see this in our accountability system and our national standards. It's all about homogenizing. We want to kind of have everything be the same or similar for everybody. Um, it tends to have a compensatory education perspective when it comes to minority language learners. Um, where we say, something is wrong with you, something is missing, you have a deficit, we have to fix that for you. And then importantly, we don't talk much about this, but most of the programs that we therefore put together are temporary programs with a real emphasis on exit. We don't talk much about exit or reclassification. I think it's one of the most damaging things that we do for programs for bilingual children. Um, because the exit process basically says, you're temporary over here, but you really should be over here. And until you have exited from wherever you are, do you count? And a two-way immersion program, I think one of the strengths, besides often stability of population, is that it just does not deal with that. Now, behind the scenes, administrators may have to reclassify for other purposes, but you are not being reclassified in order to leave the program and go to somewhere better. That's huge. 
That's how two-way immersion programs say we are a regular education program for everybody. It's a very important component. I remember struggling with my bilingual teachers when I was working up in Massachusetts that went in the um, what we call general bilingual education program, which was a late exit program. And I said to them, do not call this graduation when students are exiting from the program. You have to validate the education that they have had up till this point. It is so important. Um, so I find the exit piece um, very damaging to what we say to kids. So the pluralist piece has kind of the total opposite, right? So we say bilingualism and biliteracy is what our desired outcome is, and then we actually think that that should be the norm, since that's the norm elsewhere, and that's what we should be um, aiming for. We take a holistic view of bilingualism. We recognize that languages are connected in the brain, um, and we say whatever linguistic and cultural resources that you have as a learner is what we're going to build on and extend. We don't take a deficit perspective, we take more of a quote-unquote resource orientation, as Richard Ruiz calls it. And of course, a two-way immersion program is an integrated long-term approach, right? That's the other non-negotiable, that you have a long-term commitment. So you can see how in a two-way immersion program, because of the social political context that says assimilationist discourse is what is dominant, Doing a two-way immersion program and establish this more pluralist way of thinking is a tremendous fight. And, and many two-way teachers um, encounter that on a daily basis to be dealing with that social political context. But it's very important because we know that that's what works for bilingual children. So that's kind of the background piece. So now I want to kind of talk a little bit about why models are important but not quite enough. Here's why models and thinking about 90-10 and thinking about design features is important. It's a planning tool. It's important to think about how do we lay out a program. It's important to be consistent for students from grade to grade to grade. If there's one thing that we know from research um, for bilingual children that the worst thing we can do to them is to have one year in bilingual and then another year in English as an own an ESL and then another year back in bilingual. Consistency is very important. And that's what models help you do. It's a good planning tool. So I want to do is give you two examples why we cannot stop there, why we need to look beyond models um, and then talk about why that's also very important from a program um, diversity viewpoint. Everybody seen these? These come from the dual language of New Mexico, the dual language non-negotiables. And you've all heard about them probably. At the elementary level, you can see this back to the 50% uh, minimum. The strict separation of languages, um, I think, has been very much negotiated at the conference. So I'm not sure that that will remain a non-negotiable. It may get some additional language, is my suspicion. And a, and a long-term commitment. Middle school required to take language arts in addition to another core content course. Again, strict separation of instruction and a commitment, and then there's the high school part. I want to focus with you on the middle school part. Um, Carol Beers and I did a study in a middle school, and the middle school structure was as follows. The students were in elementary, went to this middle school, separate school, six through eight, the students are taking language arts in Spanish and social studies in Spanish. Check on my first non-negotiable, right? Even better, because it's a strand within a school and it's always a question, well, how do you integrate with, if you are a strand within the school? The school said, in order to integrate the students and to integrate um, the program, what we're going to do is we're going to group the two-way students together in Spanish, in Spanish language arts and Spanish social studies. But in the English classes, we're going to integrate them in all of the academic teams. Check on integration, right? So from a program design, oh, and then of course in the instruction, let me not forget, the instruction in Spanish was very much only in Spanish to the extent the teachers were able to do that. Challenging in social studies because the units did not necessarily call for um, didn't have a lot of Spanish materials. It's not easy to find 
good Spanish language materials on ancient Greece, for example. So that's challenging, but the teachers really worked very hard. They were aware of having to use the native language or the Spanish only. So on paper, from a design perspective, this program meets the non-negotiables. So what Carol and I did was talking to the teachers and looked a little bit further and say, now exactly how does this design affect you and how does it affect the program? I'll give you a quote from the students first. Oops. This is what the students said about middle school. We interviewed them. This is a high school. This is a 10th grader. And look what her impression was of her middle school experience, coming out of elementary, where basically everything was integrated. They left the school doing like one week in Spanish, one week in English. Then they went to middle school, and then they had the model that I just described. So notice how they are perceiving the discoupling, what we call the decoupling or discoupling of English and Spanish. Because English was now, quote unquote, mainstream. It was no longer two-way. Does that make sense? So we're integrating, but we're not saying you're integrated now and you're two-way. It's you're integrated, but you're mainstream. And the mainstream teachers kept doing what mainstream teachers were doing. Problematic. And then there's the Spanish component. So that's one splitting. And you can see how that begins to undermine what we're trying to do in a bilingual program, right? The holistic view of connecting English and Spanish is now being undermined. In Spanish, so we have Spanish social studies and Spanish language arts. The teachers would love, and they know how important it is to connect those two subject areas and reinforce what they're doing. But here's the thing. The middle school structure is a junior high structure, an important little variable. What that means is that there's 50 minute periods and there's something called an academic team. Guess who's on the academic team? Math, science, social studies, and English language arts. So where's the Spanish language arts teacher? She's with the foreign language teachers. And guess what the foreign language teachers and all the other elective teachers are doing? They're teaching when the academic team is planning, right? So that's a structural thing. This affects all of the quote unquote non-academic teachers, and that's a hierarchy that is being set up in, in the school, but it disproportionately affects the two-way program because now the two-way teachers have no planning time together. So they have to be running around after school to figure out how can we connect social studies and Spanish language arts. That's very challenging. Count two. And as one of the um, Spanish language arts teachers said, listen, it's the Fantastic Four. I can't compete. Now, what do you think that that means in terms of the Spanish language development of the students in, in, in that particular class? Very challenging. And these teachers are working very hard, mind you, to really do their best running a really good program. But what it pointed out to us was that we need to look. These are the my models are not enough slide. We need to ask questions like, how is this program integrated? And I mean integrated as opposed to assimilated, which is really what happened integrated into the school organization so that the program can, in fact, carry out its mission. So in this case, the program is very much undermined in several ways, and intentionally and non-intentionally, mind you, um, to actually do what it hopes to do. And so one of the things that the school has started to do is to work a lot more with the mainstream teachers so they begin to understand that you are part of a bilingual program and you need to know how to scaffold academic language for the bilingual children in your classroom. My second example has to do with models and student needs. And um, people who've heard me talk before have heard this example many times, and I keep repeating the example because it was such a powerful reminder to me at the time as an administrator that we cannot let the model rule and let the model dictate what we do, but we need to remind ourselves that we're doing this for the students in the program. So here's the story for that one. Barbary Elementary School um, in Massachusetts 
um, was kind of a differentiated model at the time I was working with it. And differentiated meaning the students did a lot of work in their native language in uh, particularly one, grades one and two. They had native language, language arts. They had native language math. And then in third grade, they still had native language, language arts, and everything else was integrated. And it wasn't until fourth grade that the students were fully integrated. So the integration component, by the time the kids hit fourth grade, was really important. Because the teachers were very aware that up till this point, there was some integration, but not a lot of integration between the two groups of students. Um, the school has changed to an 80-10 model at this particular point. They learned from the, the, the limitations of that model. But my point here is that integration by fourth grade was very important to the teachers. They worked very hard to keep the kids together and build relationships. And they did that in fourth grade and they did that in fifth grade. And that was kind of a major force and they worked very hard to do that. So in one year, the fifth grade teachers came to us and said, we would like to segregate the students by language group, that was like blasphemy. Like, what do you mean you want to segregate, right? Because we go with segregation, marginalization, tracking. That's our, that's our framework. And the teachers talked to us and said, well, this particular cohort of students that we have, what we're noticing is that the native English speakers need a lot of basic grammar. And what we're noticing is that the native Spanish speakers need a lot of rich vocabulary development and critical thinking through Spanish. And we're just finding it really hard to do those things together in our integrated group if we keep them together all the time. So what we would like to do is for three hours a week, just one hour for three days, we would like to group them by native language and really give them the instruction that we feel that they need and they would benefit from. So I remember Sue and I, Sue was the director at the time, we kind of looked at each other because we were very nervous about this, this move. But then we said, but we can't force the model on the students. If, in fact, this kind of temporary, focused, enrichment-oriented regrouping makes sense to support the goals of the program, then why would we insist on the model? And so we said, OK, go ahead. And in addition to this teacher saying, I can stretch those native speakers now. I can engage them in vocabulary conversations and I engage them in literature circle conversations in ways that I couldn't do. The other advantage that we totally had not thought about was that those classes for the native Spanish speakers were taught by the Puerto Rican Spanish side teacher. And what she was commenting on is like, I have discussions now with the Latinos in the program around identity and who they are that I've never been able to have before. And it kind of reminds me of Ted O'Neill's notion about, you know, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? There are reasons why that actually really works and is a good thing. Not all separation is necessarily a negative. It all depends on how we put that together and why we're doing it. And so it just kind of reminded me that we need to continuously ask ourselves whether we're allowing the model to dictate what we do as opposed to letting students' needs dictate what we do in relationship to the outcomes that we have. And if students don't happen to match the model, then what do we really do? So <clears throat> those are my two examples. My third piece is that the two-way program diversity has increased tremendously. You saw yesterday that the number of different languages has increased. Um, we have shifting demographics. Um, we traditionally have talked about native English speakers and native speakers of the minority language, native Spanish speakers, native Korean speakers. But really, the native speaker population is so diverse that it's almost not useful anymore to talk about L1 speakers. They're bilingual speakers. They are non-standard by dialectal speakers. And so we have to kind of remind ourselves that of, of that. And that diversity comes in both, both groups, by the way. We have more schools that are different kinds of schools. Um, this is coming from the Center for Applied Linguistics database. 
and we have only 98 out of the 422 that are listed in the um, school in, in the directory that are in fact whole school programs. So we need to be looking at these programs within the schools. Pieces that we don't pay too much attention to, but I can imagine vary also tremendously if you are doing a two-way program in an urban setting versus a suburban or a rural setting. We have varieties of English. We have third language learners. We've been talking about the difference between US-born bilinguals coming into the program versus non-US-born bilinguals coming into the program. They come with very different language profiles. Um, when I now talk to the teachers at Barbarians, and well, who are your native speakers and non-native speakers, they say, I have about four groups of students at least in my classroom. I have straight, strict native English speakers. I have strict native Spanish speakers, a few on both ends. Then I have two groups of bilinguals. I have one group of bilinguals that score very high on proficiency tests, and I, but equally. And I have a group of bilinguals that score very low on proficiency tests, but equally. And that's the range that they have. And some people have called that a continuum of language proficiency profile. So why not talk about that? And in some programs, you deal with newcomers. So how this, these are some of the reasons, therefore, that we need to, I think, program, talking about program models and program design don't address a lot of these questions. And so what we've done a lot in two-way immersion is talk about program model to program outcomes. Now we add context to it. And I would argue, and I'd love to be corrected, we have to do some research on this one, that it is not the program model per se that will change because you have more diversity in your population or some of the issues that are brought up. Here's where it's at. It's in the actual practices that we do. Because if I have native speaker, non-native speaker in a 90-10 model, I can put my diverse continuum of students in a 90-10 model. But what I do in my classroom is very different. And so I want us to start thinking about practices. So this is contextualization, right? Practices are contextualized. They're at your local level. What it cannot mean, and I just want to put this as a bracketing here because this is really important. See my flipping of the coin? That's, that's not what contextualization means. That's not what adapting the program to your context means. <clears throat> so if you say we need more flexibility because of our diversity in context, it doesn't mean randomness and ad hoc decision making. It doesn't mean that one year you have one policy and the following year you have a different policy. That's not what it means. When you say we have to adapt the model, it doesn't mean changing the outcomes of the program. Um, Catherine Lindholm has done, you know, talked a lot about how pr programs in California, as a result of No Child Left Behind, want to increase the amount of English beyond the 50%. It's like, that's not consistent with the dual language program and your opportunities for minority language development. So, um, maybe increasing English in response to that would not be an adaptation that actually makes sense given the outcomes that um, you're aiming for. More powerfully, her research shows that in fact, when districts do increase the amount of English, the achievement in English is not really affected. It just kind of stays the same. That's a powerful piece. Whereas if you increase instruction in minority language, that achievement does go up. So if you want bilingual outcomes, increasing English is not the way to go. And then my, my message to people is, uh, if you do change, because there's many reasons why people change, if you do change and you change your model to say a 60-40, 60% in English, 40%, just don't call it dual language. Call it something else. That's OK. Doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. It just means you do what makes sense to you, but don't call it dual language, because we have this umbrella definition. And then finally, needing to differentiate. We have a lot of talking right now about differentiation. It makes me very nervous because it's a very fine line between differentiation and tracking. So that's what it cannot mean either. We have to differentiate for enrichment. So that then raises the following question. 
When we're talking then about decision making at the local level and contextualizing based on what we know about our children, about our community and the goals that we have, what might be some non-negotiable principles that we may want to adhere to? Um, and those will operate at the school program and classroom practice. There's many ways that you can organize those principles. I've organized them as follows. And for me, that kind of goes under the linguistic and plural, cultural pluralism. The overarching principle, because two-way immersion programs have this language minority group in their program, it has to be educational equity. I was in Boston the other day, and I was talking to the teachers, <clears throat> and I said, remember that when you started this program, this program was for your bilingual learners, not for your native English speakers. It was intended to provide access to excellence for the bilingual children in the program. And later she came back to me and said, you know what? I never stopped to think about that comment because we've gone so far away to trying to please the language minority speakers in the program that we don't think really anymore about the fact, is this really the best thing for the minority language speakers in the program? So it's an important reminder, and that's what educational equity does. And then the three lenses that I use to, underneath that to think about practices and policies are structuring for integration, promoting additive bilingualism, and affirming identities. <clears throat> For me, these are not prescriptions, they're principles that help us ask the right questions. So as we're trying to figure out what's the best decision to make today, these are my kind of checklists that I keep in the back of my mind. Let's go through them. <clears throat> Educational equity has everything to do with fairness and justice. It asks questions about is what we do somehow disproportionately affecting a particular group in our school? It asks questions about resources. How do we distribute them within the school and do we do that fairly and equitably? It asks questions about, for example, we were talking in the workshop earlier um, this week about special needs services. That if we say that the program is for all children, do we, in fact, offer special education services effectively for all children? Or do those services only come or primarily come in English? Um, a lot of programs are working with RTI, response to intervention. Well, in what language does that support come? What assessments do you use to figure out where that support needs to be targeted? And the other <coughs> important, excuse me, <coughs> The other important principle with that, and I think um, Lau versus Nichols um, continues to be an, a huge court case for bilingual children, where the court was very clear. If you do the same, same textbooks, same teachers, same materials in English, and you provide that for fluent English speakers, and you provide the same thing for English language learners, you do not provide an equitable in education. And that's a really difficult concept because we would like to do the same for everybody, thinking that that way we are being equitable. In many cases, when it comes to whether it's two-way immersion programs, whether it's the students within the two-way immersion programs, you have to do things slightly differently in order to be equitable. And it's a fine line, right? Because we also have the segregate <coughs> to track kind of differentiation. So it's a fine line, but it is so important, and particularly right now, when we get prescribed curricula for students, it's all standardized, there's a pacing guide. Um, <clears throat> it's one thing to do that, it's, I don't think that's good for any student, but if you do that, you have to think about how does this affect the different students in my, my classroom? It's a difficult concept. So structuring for integration, I start with that one because it's one that we don't talk too much about. Um, and part of my dissertation work was really looking at that integration component because what I found looking at transitional bilingual education program that there was absolutely no connection between the bilingual program and the rest of the school. 
and it had a devastating impact on what was possible within that program. And so I looked at what are the linkages, what are the connections um, between the, the, the programs. Structure for integration, and I would wish we had a better term than integration because for many people, I did this in Europe, I talked about integration in Europe, and they were like, you mean assimilation. It's like, no, 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 no. I don't mean this, but I haven't gotten a better, thank you so much, Tara. I have found a better term than integration. So if anybody has a better term than integration to denote that we bring together different groups on an equal status basis, because that's what that's all about. Whereas what assimilation does is to say, here's the norm you've got to fit in. And I also don't like the word inclusion um, because it has kind of the same thing. We have the mainstream, we make some accommodations for you, but we don't change the whole system. And integration means you kind of change the whole system for everybody. And that linguistic and cultural diversity becomes the starting point for, the, for, for decision making. How many times I've been in schools and they're having a parent-teacher comfort, like a parent or, you know, meeting, and we ask the question, so have you, do we have interpreters? Oh, no, we forgot. Cannot do. Right, you want to think about all of your parents from the very beginning. So if you have a parent conference, you make sure the interpreters are there. You are not welcoming as a school if you don't provide those services for them. From the get-go, not if they show up and say, oh, we have to find somebody. You want to make sure that it's equal. This also asks the question, by the way, in the classroom, that when you look at students and they're interacting in small groups, who gets to interact with whom? And who gets to talk? Because that also has to do with equal status relationships. And they're not always equal in a two-way immersion program because of the diversity. And that's something as a teacher you want to mediate. The additive by and multilingualism. Um, I think Ophelia Garcia um, criticized the use of additive um, because it suggests that there's one and then we add another. Um, I don't mean that, um, but it's such a well-used term in our field to denote the enrichment factor that um, I think is worth keeping. But we are dealing with a dynamic view of multilingualism or bilingualism, and, and this is important, and we're dealing with opportunities for using, developing, displaying, and engage with multiple languages. In the context of two-way immersion programs, I sometimes get concerned that we do a lot of talking about what we do in the minority language, and that we sometimes don't look at the quality of instruction in English. Both languages are important. We cannot let the English side off the hook, not providing the right kinds of supports. It doesn't mean more English. It just means making sure that the English that we provide is appropriate for them when it's being offered. So this particular principle asks the question, do we actually treat bilinguals as bilinguals? And as you can imagine, in a two-way immersion program, because you have this whole continuum of bilinguals, that's actually a really important piece. And so one of the themes from, from the conference has been, do we separate the languages and keep the languages in 100%? And my, part of my response to that is, maybe that's not the question to ask. This principle suggests that the question to ask is, in what ways do we allow bilingual and multilingual resources to contribute to our outcomes? And that may mean, because we have a desire to teach an academic register in both languages, that we create both monolingually oriented spaces and more bilingually oriented spaces. And the big word there is purposeful. But it's hard to be purposeful if we don't start even thinking along a principled way of dealing with the issue. So it's really important that we treat bilinguals as bilinguals and that we look at the quality of instruction across the different languages. Another piece that this one points out as well is that we need to pay attention to non-standard varieties. And how do we respond to that? We tend to, again, look at Spanish-English, I think anybody who's been teaching in these programs is like, oh, there's a lot of variety and variation in Spanish. There's a lot of variety and variation in English that comes into your program, that's part of your program. So this question, this principle asks you to think about how do we respond to that diversity? 
Do we respond to it in an additive way? And we say, this is, these are all resources you have. We build and we stretch and we extend. Or do we somehow still send a message that says, there's a standard Spanish and there's a standard English, and that's really the better one, as opposed to talking about appropriateness according to context. Very different discussion. Affirming identities, I think this is probably the hardest one in a two-way program. You can, um, because we are in the United States, it's such a kind of dominant culture environment. And everything that comes down in terms of educational policy kind of reinforces that. And so it's, it's a struggle to keep the cultural diversity in. But it is so important. There is no good teaching without connecting to where the students are at. If we skip that step, our instruction won't be very effective, right? Um, I was in a two-way immersion classroom, and they were, um, this is the English side, and the teacher was uh, talking about camping. And this was a Wednesday, so she's been talking about this particular reading since Monday. And finally, on Wednesday, she's dealing with the reading, they're talking about it, she asks, on Wednesday, who has ever gone camping? Half of the students raised their hand. And she's like, oh. And then we talked about that later. It's like, you know, what do you think? How would it be different if you had asked that question at the very beginning of your unit on Monday? And he's like, yeah, I probably should have. So this year, actually, she, she made a point of telling me that I started asking them about their camping experiences. And I said, well, did it make a difference? She's like, oh, yes, it did. And that's the important part. But background knowledge, just as simple as that, and asking and drawing students in at where they are at becomes so important. We also need to worry a little bit about representation. The materials that we get from textbook publishers is not necessarily always reflective of the students that we teach. Now, the equity principle, remember, if I walk into a school as a child and the only images and representations that I see are of people who are not like me, then my experience is not equitable to the student who gets to see their models all the time. I remember being in um, a classroom in a kindergarten, and they did a great family cutting out pictures kind of activity where they really got to be creatively constructing, like who did they think their family was. And then I looked at the actual magazines that were being used. Like, they're all white people in the magazine. And I looked around in the classroom, and was like I could find one Euro-American child in the classroom. There were no, there's no sensitivity to the fact that maybe we want to have a whole different set of magazines in order for students to say, this is who my family is. Now, you don't do this stuff, I know. But it's a question we need to be asking. So when you look at your readers, when you look at your social studies, you want to be thinking about how are the students that I have represented or not represented? Where is the silencing that might be happening in terms of the content? Because it's not always the obvious thing to do. It's the additional steps. And that's why this goal is often so hard, because it's extra that we need to do in order to make it work. OK. So these principles, and I went through them pretty quickly, but you can understand why, where they were coming from. They're pretty solidly grounded. Um, they work together, and each one of them is important. And I already kind of talked about um, these examples. It can't mean assimilation. And when the talk comes about an integrated classroom, it cannot mean that we only meet the needs of one group of students in the classroom and not of the other. One of the challenges in a two-way program, especially if you have more of a gap in Spanish between some students who are still kind of acquiring the language and you have fluent Spanish speakers, is to make sure that you don't only do scaffolding for the second language learners, simplifying your language, making it more accessible, and you forget to stretch your fluent speaker. It's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to do. But from an additive bilingual perspective and from an equity perspective, we've got to ask the question, right? Are we challenging all students appropriately given where they're at? And can be that we just meet the needs of just one of the groups in the program. 
So in short, wrap this up. I asked the question early on on contextualization and two-way immersion. So I think what we need to be talking about is contextualized practice. So we have a good understanding, and we need a good understanding. If we do not understand our communities, if we don't understand our students and where they're coming from, then that's the first step to take. We need to understand where they're at. <clears throat> We also need to be very clear on our outcomes. What is it that we really want for our children? And right now, dual language has kind of identified those as bilingualism, biliteracy, da 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 da. You may have other dimensions that you're very interested in. Now, this middle part are multiple pathways. It's not a model. It's multiple pathways that we create in our schools through decisions around program, curriculum, pedagogy, and assessment. Because it's the practices in the end that makes a difference. That means you, as teachers, as administrators. That's where it's at. I can create a fantastic program, regardless of the model, if I have the right teachers to do it. Those choices, however, cannot be random choices, remember? So those pathways need to be informed by some under foundational kind of underlying core principles. And again, I came up with these. Other people can make up other ones. But we have to come up with these. These are the things that will organize our decision making. It's kind of our checklist to make sure that what we do <clears throat> connects the students to the outcomes. And so that we keep thinking about equity that we keep thinking about how do we affirm identities for all of our students, that we think about multilingualism, and that we think about integration at the multiple levels. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you, Dr. Dijon. We were so excited to hear your talk, and it brings us to really think about lots of questions in two ways. Hello, everybody. My name is Anna Hernandez, and I'm going to take your questions this morning. Is there, I'm going to give you a minute to think, pair, share, one minute to think about some questions for Dr. Dijon. In the meantime, I'm going to ask her a question that I've been pondering and thinking about. And it has to do with the third goal of dual language immersion, which is cross-cultural competence, which is one of the issues that I particularly see teachers really struggling about. So my question to you is, since this is just a, a challenging concept to implement in our classrooms, what ideas can you provide to overcome these challenges? How long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> That's just a really complex question. Um, I think one thing that um, I have found helpful is to shift the focus from thinking about separate cultures which is sometimes what we ended up doing. Cross-cultural understanding means you learn about a culture. We put a little circle around, and this is a culture, is to try and move the conversation to issues of social justice. And we talked about that at um, another meeting, too. Because those issues go, go across. Those are applicable and relevant to all of the students that you have in the school. And it kind of frees you up to tackle broader themes, because I think sometimes the cross-cultural component is hard because we keep it at the topic level. And I gave in the workshop the example that one of my teachers gave us, like, oh, now I get this multicultural piece, is that traditionally you have, um, kids have to do biographies of, say, Washington, George Washington, and that's, you know, fourth grade curriculum, that's what you do, and everybody does some kind of biography. And so what she said was, but that really excludes the kids who are not from this country. And she was Brazilian, and so she's like, Brazilian kids don't know George Washington. So what she did, she helped teachers kind of flip the focus from the topic to the idea. And so she said, why don't we ask and create <clears throat> a unit around leadership? All the kids can talk about what they consider good leaders and what qualities they have. And then they can talk about different leaders that they might have or have encountered in their own country, in their lives. And they can still learn about George Washington. I'm not devaluing learning about George Washington. But it's so much more inclusive to ask the question, what is leadership? And how might leadership actually vary 
um, than it is who was George Washington, and here are the facts about George Washington. And that's much more moving towards the social justice agenda, and I think that's, although it's, I think it's really hard to do, I think also because your materials are not designed for that, which means a lot of teacher work in order to make that happen. Thank you so much for your answer. <clears throat> okay, that gave you plenty of time to think of a question. <laughs> so I will spot. come around and see if anyone else. Yes. Hello. Hello, if practice makes a difference, what needs to change in teacher training? Ah. <laughs> it does come down to that, doesn't it? And I'm, you know, I have to promote my own session after this, which talks about emergent themes and two-way immersion. But there's also a teacher education symposium happening at the very same time. Um, quality, te we cannot skip on quality teachers. Um, and we actually were talking about exactly besides kind of the general pieces of two-way immersion, what what kind of skills that that are required. If you kind of take the basic skills of being able to manipulate language and content learning, being sensitive to issues of culture, I think two other skills that we need to work on with immersion teachers. One is how do you advocate for your program? It's a skill. It's a skill to learn to talk about your program. And we need to help our teachers do that. We need to give them the tools that say, and here's the information, and here's what we do and why we do it. The other piece that I think is maybe even more important is that we need to teach them to critically look at what's going on around them. They will get mainstream stuff all the time, right? Because that's what the district does. They get the professional development that's oriented towards mainstream teachers. They get the materials that everybody's supposed to do. We have to help them. If they don't already do, be able to do that, they, we have to help them look at those materials and say, this is what will work, this is what will not work. And so we need to develop this kind of critical analytical lens with them, not just in terms of their own materials, because I think that piece comes very natural, but in terms of mainstream materials, things that come their way that they have to make judgments about. So I would add those two components. So I think advocacy is, is, a, is a huge part of teacher preparation. Thank you very much. Another question? Whoa, I gotta run way up there. <laughs> Good morning. Good um, morning. So uh, next year we'll be starting um, our first ninth grade, well, our first cohort of students who have gone through dual language immersion uh, will be starting ninth grade. And um, right now, you know, it was very important to the school board and it was very important to us to have them integrated into the larger school community. And so that was a, um, one of the priorities for us as we were designing what this was going to look like. But now I see that it's sort of a decoupled system. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I guess my question is when our students who have gone through uh, two-way immersion, kindergarten through eighth grade, are integrated into English language, English language arts with students, um, you know, their peers from, from Gen Ed and ESL and, and, every, and all the other programs. Um, are there any, you know, key features that we can talk to our English language arts teachers about uh, that they can kind of implement for, for a small group of students in their, in their classrooms who have gone through this program? Good question. <clears throat> I hope that makes sense. It, it does make sense because I, I think one of the pieces that we found with the middle school that we had to do was to remind the English language arts teachers that they are not just teaching native English speakers who come from a very specific cult kind of culturally shared background. And so a lot of the conversation was, with them was around two issues. One is multiculturalism and how do you bring that into your English language arts. And the other piece was academic language development, because these were middle schoolers. And so they were very much still in need of academic language scaffolding at the middle school level. And so it was a lot about don't judge the English from the bilingual learners that you have without kind of considering that you may still need to do scaffolding for them, because they're bilingual learners. They'll be that for the rest of their lives but that they don't judge it as, oh, the program didn't work or something was wrong with the child. And so to actually have an approach in English language arts where the teachers 
recognize that they have a diverse classroom. For all students, it has to be a diverse classroom. Then the other piece that I would do is to make sure that the English language arts teachers understand what these students have been doing in Spanish. That needs to be a conversation between whoever is teaching in Spanish and is teaching in English. So they understand, because at least at the middle school level, a lot of the Spanish speakers actually did still um, much better work or different work in Spanish than they did in English. But those English teachers never saw that because the Spanish language arts teachers were never part of the planning team to be able to say, look, this is what the students is doing in Spanish. So to create, in that sense, bilingual spaces for the teacher so they understand, ah, this is what they're doing in both languages because that's treating them as bilinguals. But I have a suspicion if you have ESL students in there too that that notion of bilingual learners and diversity should not be too much of a stretch for English language arts people. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Um, we are, we're in a situation in Hawaii around um, standardized testing and accountability mm -hmm. uh, to meet NCLB laws. And I'm wondering if you can uh, share a little bit more about the Lau versus Nichols case and the benefits that um, bilingual education did or did not receive as a result of that case. Lau versus Nichols was in 1974. Um, it happened in San, in San Francisco, and um, the parents basically argued that doing the same English instruction for the children was not equitable. Now, the courts didn't say anything about bilingual education. They simply said, you need to do something. It's, it's not fair, it's not equitable if you don't do something for the students. And they left that question of, do we do bilingual education or do we do English only kind of up to the states? You go figure that out. The courts weren't going to touch that one. What happened as a result of that court case, though, that the Office of Civil Rights took that to mean we should be implementing bilingual education, right? Now, in the United States, there is a large body since then, because we were so concerned with does it work, of research that has looked at bilingual education in its various forms and how effective it is. And there are many studies um, that confirm that students who are in a dual language program or in a bilingual program do as well as or better than in English, even though they have been in a bilingual program. That research base, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we're, we're kind of done with that. We keep asking the question because it's much easier to keep arguing over it. Um, and as I said the other day, what it doesn't allow us to do is to really ask the question, what do we need to do to make everybody bilingual? It keeps us kind of arguing over, does it work or not? So that's kind of what, what allowed. It basically gave us, based on the, on, on the Civil Rights Act, the opportunity to make sure that we said to schools, you have to do something for bilingual children. You can't just dump them in a mainstream classroom and have them sink and swim. I wanted to ask a question about the model. I mean, the model, you explained to us really what it is, but I'm wondering the extent to which in this contextual, contextualization process, and I like the idea of really adapting models to context, do you see like bilingualism, multilingualism, translanguaging as a legitimate model or practice? I, I do, because I think for me the additive bilingual Lism piece principle starts with what the practices are that you are used to, right? And so you can't deny, we've, we've had this discussion now several times, you can't deny the practices that children are already naturally using. So if children are translanguaging, that's what they do. So my, yeah. my question is more, how can we use that then as a pedagogical tool to reach our goals? So would you use it as, a, as one day as a third model, for example, like um, one way, two way, indigenous? I a translanguaging way, model? But bilang <coughs> bilanguaging or multilanguaging or whatever as a model, as a, as a legitimate model. You see, I'm not sure that I would put it as, as a model. To me, it falls into practice. So the two way program model, if you, has to do with the students coming in. It hasn't to do anything to do, I don't think, with language use patterns within the program per se. So the question is, can you have a two-way immersion program where you say translanguaging is the norm? Or 
or train them to do or train them to do that I, I think as part of the, that's the additive bilingual piece it's creating spaces in a purposeful way that allows that to happen if that's what the natural piece is for the students it's not true for all kids though and so in some contexts translanguaging might be very rich and in other contexts translanguaging is really not that big of a component of the program what I'm concerned with is that if we make decisions about how we translanguage and how we use it, what spaces we create, that we keep thinking of it as how does it support the goals that we have. 